Happy New Year, and welcome to the Fellowship of Rocky River Presbyterian Church in Rocky River, Ohio, for this service celebrating the Holy Day of Epiphany, marking the end of the 12 days of Christmas. I'm John Fancher, the pastor of the church, and it's a blessing that you are here because the power of God's Holy Spirit draws us together through time and space so that we can worship together. Later in this service, we will be celebrating the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. But now we are called to worship. From restless sleep and anxious dreams, let us walk toward the light. From shadowy fears and gloomy thoughts, let us walk in the light. From dark depressions and worried futures, let us walk into the light. Upon us, light has risen. Let God's light bring us hope and comfort and joy. Let us pray. God of all time, with the beginning of a new year, we resolve to improve the quality of our lives. We want to please ourselves, impress others, and serve you. And yet there are many behaviors which are difficult to let go. In spite of facades we may present, too often our hearts harbor intentions that are neglectful, devious, selfish, shallow, lazy. We try to hide in the darkness, in the shadows, thinking you might not uncover the uncomfortable reality of our behavior. Help us, God. May the light of your mercy blind us from pursuing former ways. May the light of the world lead us toward lives of faithfulness to you. We pray in the name of the light of the world, Jesus Christ. Amen. And remember what the Apostle Paul tells us. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that we have been saved. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. And now I invite you to listen for God's word in this bit of ancient poetry from Isaiah chapter 60. It's filled with details that we associate with the wise men's visit to the baby Jesus. It's also filled with the joy that is ours in the season of Epiphany. Isaiah chapter 60. Arise, shine, your light has come. The Lord's glory has shone upon you. Though darkness covers the earth and gloom the nations, the Lord will shine upon you. God's glory will appear over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to your dawning radiance. Countless camels will cover your land, young camels from Midian and Ephah. They will all come from Sheba, carrying gold and incense, proclaiming the Lord's praises. And then this familiar story of the wise men sets forth the epiphany message in picture pageantry. Listen from Matthew chapter 2. Jesus was born in the town of Bethlehem in Judea during the time when Herod was king. Soon afterward, some men who studied the stars came from the east to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the baby born to be the king of the Jews? We saw his star when it came up in the east, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard about this, he was very upset. So was everyone else in Jerusalem. Herod called together all the chief priests, all the teachers of the law, and asked them, Where will the Messiah be born? In the town of Bethlehem in Judea, they answered, for this is what the prophet wrote. Bethlehem in the land of Judah, you are by no means the least of the leading cities of Judah, for from you will come a leader who will guide my people Israel. So Herod called the visitors from the east to a secret meeting. 
and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem with these instructions. Go and make a careful search for the child, and when you find him, let me know, so that I too may go and worship him. And so they left. And on their way, they saw the same star they had seen in the east. And when they saw it, how happy they were, what joy was theirs. It went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. They went into the house, and when they saw the child with his mother, Mary, they knelt down and worshipped him. They brought out their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and presented them to him. And then they returned to their country by another road, since God had warned them in a dream not to go back to Herod. Well, our Moravian star, a symbol for Jesus, the light of the world, our Moravian star reminds me of a story told by preacher John Claypool. Several years ago, a family visited Carlsbad Caverns, and when they reach that point in the tour when the guide extinguishes all of the lights to give the people the experience of total darkness, a little boy began to cry out in fear, but his older, his older sister gave him comfort. She said, don't worry, little brother. There's somebody here who knows how to turn on the lights. Well, friends... The one who declared, let there be light, has sent a light to the world, a light that the world's worst, deepest darkness could not overcome. We've seen God's glory in the light that we know as Jesus Christ. The season of Christmas ends with a celebration of the light of the world. That day, which is this year actually Thursday, January 6th, that day is called Epiphany. That Greek word epiphany means manifestation because the love of God became visible and present to you and me. It became manifest in the person of Jesus, the Son of God born to Mary and Joseph. Our ability to see God in Jesus Christ is the reason that our worship space is graced by a Moravian star reminiscent of that fabled star of Bethlehem. The Christian church has come to use the Holy Day of Epiphany to commemorate the scriptural account when the wise men visited the Holy Family. And what a great story that is. So picturesque in our imaginations, whether, whether we envision it portrayed at Radio City Music Hall in their Christmas spectacular with opulent costumes and brilliant stage effects, or more likely, by children wearing bathrobes and headscarves as they act out the Bible story in a church program. There's so much that we could study about this story. We could explore the astronomical aspects of that fabled star of the East. What sort of heavenly body was that so-called star of Bethlehem? Was it a conjunction of planets, a supernova, was it a miraculous celestial object created by God solely for this specific purpose? We could explore the nature of the gifts that were given to the young child and his parents. We'd note that gold and frankincense and myrrh were not exactly appropriate gifts for a baby. But we could ask if the gifts were intended to signal that Jesus would become king of kings and ruler of all peoples. Or we could ponder the significance of the wise men being told to return to their homeland by a road other than, other than the one that they had taken. Was that merely a security warning because of the impulsive anger of Herod? Or was there also a message about how their lives would never be the same after encountering the Christ child? There are so many things we could explore in this story a story that we think we know so well. But let's think for just a moment about the characters in this story, the so-called wise men who looked for signs indicating that important events were unfolding somewhere in the world. Their first information came from that star that rose in the east, according to what Matthew's gospel said. 
but the star didn't tell them enough. They needed to consult the Hebrew scriptures, and to do that, they traveled to Jerusalem, the center of Jewish worship, where the scriptures directed them to proceed to Bethlehem, a village about an hour away by foot. But do you realize what happened in the meantime? To consult the Hebrew scriptures, the wise men had to talk to the priests who were serving in the palace of King Herod of Jerusalem and Judea. Now, Herod himself was not Jewish, which meant that the Jews called him a Gentile, a non-Jew. But the Roman emperor had put Herod in charge of this land populated largely by Jews, so Herod gave himself the title King of the Jews. Consequently, a Gentile king employed Jewish priests to help him understand the minds and the hearts of these people that he ruled over. Now, as faithful Jews, these temple priests would be focused on the desire of all Judaism, namely, to look for the coming of God's promised Messiah, God's chosen one. But what actually happened, according to Matthew's Gospel? Well, the wise men consulted with the priests of the temple in Jerusalem. The Jewish priests heard from the wise men about a star which signaled to them the birth of a king. The priests told the wise men about the prophecies of the birth of the Messiah. And then the wise men decided to continue on to Bethlehem. But then what did the priests do? You know what they didn't do? They didn't say, hey, you know what? This one sounds legit. We should go with these guys and see what's happening in Bethlehem. But they didn't. The priests didn't act on their faith. As Bible scholar Tom Long once put it, the chief priests and scribes know the scriptures, but they miss the Messiah. And yet some foreigners, Gentiles at that, some foreigners traveled great distances to find and visit and worship Jesus and then return to their daily lives, spreading the impact of their encounter with the Christ child. Through the Magi, we have encountered God's Savior born into our world. So what do we do now? Reflect Christ's compassion, forgiveness, acceptance. Reflect His love in the way we live our lives so that others will be drawn to His light too. Robert Fulgham is probably best known for his little piece entitled, All I've Ever Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. You probably have read it. On one occasion, he told this story, a story of attending a meeting. The meeting was about to wrap up. And when the leader asked, are there any other questions? Fulgham couldn't resist the temptation. So he asked, what is the meaning of life? Well, Fulgham said the usual expected laughter followed, and then people started to pack up to leave. But then another man in the room, a Dr. Alexander, Alexander Papaderos, he held up his hand and he stilled the room. And he looked at Fulgham for a long time, asking with his eyes if he was serious. And when he could tell that Fulgham was, Dr. Papaderos said, I will answer your question. And then taking his wallet out of his hip pocket, Dr. Papaderos fished into that leather billfold and brought out a very small round mirror, about the size of a quarter. And what he said went like this. He said, when I was a small child during the war, we were very poor, we lived in a remote village, one day on the road, I found the broken pieces of a mirror a German motorcycle had wrecked in that place. Well, I tried to find all the pieces to put them together, but that was not possible, and so I kept only the largest piece, this one. And by scratching it on a stone, I was able to make it round. I began to play with it as a toy and became fascinated by the fact that I could reflect light into dark places where the sun would never shine, in deep holes and crevices, in dark closets. It became a game for me to get light into the most inaccessible places I could find. 
Dr. Papaderos went on, I kept that little mirror, and as I went about my growing up, I would take it out in idle moments and continue the challenge of that game. As I became a man, I grew to understand that this was not just a child's game, but a metaphor for what I might do with my life. I came to understand that I am not the light or the source of the light, but light, truth, understanding, knowledge, light is there. And it will only shine in dark places if I reflect it. <coughs> so Dr. Papaderos continued, I am a fragment of a mirror whose whole design and shape I do not know. Nevertheless, with what I have, with who I am, I can reflect light into the dark places of this world, into the dark places of the human heart, and change some things for some people. Perhaps others may see and do likewise. That is what I am about. This is the meaning of my life. Well, the priests of Herod were going through the motions. They had all the indications, the scriptures, the prodding of inquiring visitors, even a supernatural sign. And yet, if they'd actually tried to embody the faith they professed, if they'd actually looked for the Messiah they claimed they'd been waiting for, lo, these many centuries, they would have discovered that he was born just five miles south of town in a sleepy little burg called Bethlehem. Those priests serving under Herod could have joined the wise men in worshiping Jesus, but they were content to go through the motions. We need to be like the wise men who hopped on their camels and made tracks. The light of Jesus has been shown to us. The light of the world has shined upon us. And God now calls us to reflect that light into the dark places in the world, into the dark places of the human heart. Indeed, that's a message contained in a succinct prayer written a couple decades ago by elders of our church, a prayer aptly entitled, The Prayer of Rocky River Presbyterian Church. May these words of prayer inspire our attitude and our actions in this new year. God, as your children, may we establish roots in you, grow in your grace, and reflect your love in the manner of Jesus. Amen. Well, in a few moments, you're invited to join me and other worshipers in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. Naturally, you need to provide for yourself the elements that you will partake. And so if you've not done so already, now's a good time to go to your cupboard and get whatever you will eat and drink for communion. Now, Jesus used ordinary foods readily available to him, common bread, everyday wine, and maybe that's what you'll use or maybe you'll find some other grain and beverage. But what you use isn't as important as the fact that you are sharing in the Lord's Supper with me and with others. And so friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. People will come from east and west and north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim our Lord's death and resurrection until he comes in glory in the fullness of time. In this community of faith, in this church, we pray for one another and for the world. And one of the ways we pray, each week we select people in our membership at random to be the focus of our prayers. And this week in our prayer focus, we have Jason and Amanda, Amy, and Amanda and Chris and their children, Lucas and Hannah. We want to pray for you and for those who are on your hearts. You can share your prayer requests with us by dropping us a line or giving us a call. We want to pray today for persons who find themselves frequently or chronically enshrouded by depression. 
We pray for safety for all who are traveling. We pray for my colleague Charlie, for his family, for the congregation he loves and that loves him. We pray for endurance and hope for the families and businesses and churches who are figuring out next steps to begin recovering from December's furious tornadoes. And we pray for God's blessing of healing for Julius, and for Louis, Renate, Kathy, Nancy, Janice, Karen, RJ, Ramira, Corinna, Cody, and Joanna. An ancient liturgy of the, uh, an ancient uh, litany of the church in, engages us in a call and response. And I invite you to speak the response that will appear on your screen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. And so with the names that we remembered in our prayer focus and in those prayer requests, with those names in our hearts, let us turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord of light and life, to you even the darkest nights of our souls are as bright as noontime for you are able to see where our sin-dimmed sight cannot. Help us then to trust you to lead us through the times of thick shadows when vision fails and reason stumbles, when what we thought was certain cannot be found, when that which we thought was forever turns out to be fleeting, when that which we thought of as security turns out to be empty of hope. God, give us the courage to pray for ourselves and the compassion to pray for others. Illumine our, <coughs> illumine our waking and working with the light of your presence so that we can see the path to which your purpose calls us. For you made yourself present to us in the birth of our brother Jesus, and see, he signaled his eternal presence with us in memorial gifts of bread and cup. So may we be blessed by your Holy Spirit, enlivening the food and drink we receive and share, so that as we eat and as we drink, we'll re we will remember the flesh and blood of the one who came in your holy name to serve and save the world. As your birthing star once revealed your presence to the world, work through your church to shine the revealing light of your truth into every dark corner of injustice, bigotry, greed, and deceit, until everyone knows that the Son of God has come to reclaim the earth. Holy God, bind us together in your love and lead us in lives of faithfulness to you, we thank you, God of heaven and earth, for hearing this and every prayer, even the one prayer said by many. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Just as many individual grains of wheat are brought together to become one loaf, so our Lord Jesus Christ brings us together, sisters and brothers all around the world, to become one body in Him. As we gather at this table, we remember how Jesus gathered with His disciples and took bread blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is for you. When you eat this, remember me. This is the bread of heaven. Take and eat.
after the supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, remember me. This is the cup of salvation. Drink of it, all of you. Let us pray. God of hope, because he was born into human flesh, your son Jesus knows the reality of our life struggles. By inviting us to share this bread and this cup, Jesus welcomes us into his life. Strengthened by the presence of his living spirit among us today, may we welcome him into our lives so we will follow his lead in living to please you. Amen. Well, friends, thank you for being part of this worship experience. You're the reason we are here, to inspire and comfort and encourage you in your calling to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ in your life. If you have comments or reactions or suggestions for our worship services, we would love to hear from you. Give us a call or drop us a note. We also welcome your prayer requests. You can provide as much or as little detail as you're comfortable with. Please let me know if you would like me to hold that prayer request in pastoral confidence or if you would like me to share your prayer request in an upcoming service. Your financial gifts and offerings continue to support our charitable mission outreach efforts and our ministry, and for that we thank you. You can make gifts to the church by dropping them off or putting them in the mail using your bank's bill pay program, or on our website, which is www.riverpress.org. You'll find new worship broadcasts posted on our church's Facebook page and our YouTube channel. They're posted every Saturday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time, and you can watch them at your convenience anytime after that. In addition to these worship broadcasts, we also offer in-person worship in our sanctuary on Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m. And for the sake of all, masks are required in the church building. And now, may your joy be colored with heavenly light. May God's grace be abundant and forgiving. May word and silence weave a holy pattern in your life. And may the awesome mystery of God bring new life to winter days. And until next time, the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, give you peace today and forever. Amen.